Hi, this is Ed Rudiger, and I am absolutely delighted you're tuning in to hear another one of my sermons. Now, I'm preaching this particular sermon on May 7th in my church in Sligo, Pennsylvania. Now, if you don't know northwestern Pennsylvania, Sligo is a little town just south of Clarion. It's about five miles south of Clarion, right off of Interstate 80. And my church is Sligo Presbyterian Church. And we're in the middle or we're passing the midpoint of in a series we started a few weeks ago. So listen for the word of God. When I got up this morning, I saw on my phone that they're calling for scattered thunderstorms this afternoon and evening. And even though this is hardly a surprise, not for this time of year, I've got to admit I immediately experienced two very different emotions. I mean, on one hand, I felt kind of, well, kind of excited. You see, I grew up on the Chesapeake Bay, so listening to thunderstorms, man, that brings me right back to childhood. And as some of y'all know, I am a big fan of horror movies made back in the 1930s. And as everybody like me knows, it's during a thunderstorm that you make the monster. And so on one hand, I was kind of looking forward to this afternoon and evening. But on the other hand, that's not the case for everyone. For, for some, thunderstorms are really scary. As a matter of fact, I know someone really close in fact, the single individual with whom I spend most of my life, well, she doesn't like thunderstorms at all. And of course, I'm talking about Coco Chanel. And so if this storm report is correct, I think Debbie and I are in for a challenging time as we deal with a trembling little dog. But you know, as the church, well, we don't face just a challenging morning or afternoon or evening. I think all of us would agree we face a pretty challenging world. And because of that, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how we, as the body of Christ, can deal with the world that we have, not necessarily the one that we want. And over this time, we've used some passages from the first letter of Peter to talk about how, in the face of this world, the church can praise God for what he's, what he's done and for what praise can do. And then we looked at how we can remember that we've been both rescued and redeemed by God. And last week we focused on how the church can intentionally grow in its determination and dedication, as well as its understanding and unity. And so in the face of a challenging world, we can praise and remember and grow. Now, that's what we've covered already. And this morning, we're going to move to the fourth thing that we can do. We can resist. You see, in, in the face of all the challenges that surround us, I think the church can and should, in fact, the church must resist the temptation to compromise what it believes so that it can avoid conflict with the outside and feel comfortable within. And I'll tell you, I think that temptation to compromise is really strong. For example, I think it's really tempting to just shrug our shoulders, run with the crowd, and then jump off a cliff because everyone else is doing it. And I think it's really tempting to ignore what Jesus actually taught, you know, about feeding the hungry and welcoming strangers and caring for the sick, because the world tells us that there are other issues way more important than these, right? And I think it's really tempting to buy into the notion that what we believe is only important if it can be used to advance a particular agenda. Therefore, it's perfectly all right to cherry-pick what you like and ignore the rest. Now, I think these are some of the very real temptations that we as the body of Christ face nowadays. And how can we resist them? Well, that's going to be our focus this morning. And as we've done three times before, we're going to use a passage from Peter's first letter. And we're going to consider three temptations that he thought believers must resist if they want to be the church in a challenging world. For example, first, according to Peter, the church must resist the temptation to deny its identity. In other words, for the sake of the world around us, we need to remember who we are. And I think that was exactly what Peter had in mind when he wrote this. Dear friends, you are foreigners and strangers on this earth. So I beg you not to surrender to those desires that fight against you. Always let others see you behaving properly, even though they may still accuse you of doing wrong. Then on the day of judgment, they will honor God by telling the good news that they saw you do. Now, that's what he said. And I don't know about y'all, 
But I think this is pretty clear. Whether we like it or not, we, and I'm talking about you and me, we are foreigners and strangers. Man, we are aliens and exiles on this earth. That's who we are. And that's who we'll continue to be. Therefore, we're never going to fit neatly into the world around us, not unless we surrender our identity. And for that reason, we should never surrender to those desires that fight against us. In other words, we need to listen to what Paul wrote to the Galatians. People's desires make them give in to immoral ways, filthy thoughts, and shameful deeds. They, pra- they worship idols, practice witchcraft, hate others, and are hard to get along with. People become jealous, angry, and selfish. They not only argue and cause trouble, but they are envious. They get drunk and car- carry on at wild parties and do other things as well. I told you I told you before, and I'm telling you again, no one who does these things will share in the blessings of God's kingdom. I mean, we need to recognize that this is not who God called us to be. While at the same time, it's also important for us to accept that we're expected to behave properly. Just like Peter already wrote in the first chapter of his letter. Always live as God's holy people should, because God is the one who chose you, and he is holy. That's why the scriptures say, I am the holy God and you must be holy too. You say that God is your father, but God doesn't have have favorites. He judges all people by what they do. You must honor God while you live as strangers here on earth. You were rescued from the useless way of life you learned from your ancestors. But you know you were not rescued by such things as silver or gold that don't last forever. Simply put, God called us to be his people. And he expects us to do good things and not things that are wrong. That's who we are. And for that reason, we must never deny our identity. And to be the church in a challenging world, that's the first temptation we really need to resist. And second, as a community of believers, the church must also resist the temptation to ignore its purpose, to ignore its mission. In other words, we need to accept the reason we've been called together and to do what's necessary to get the job done. And you know, I think that's what Peter was getting at when he wrote this. The Lord wants you to obey all human authorities, especially the emperor who rules over everyone. You must also obey governors because they, were, they are sent by the emperor to punish criminals and to praise good citizens. God wants you to silence stupid and ignorant people by doing right. You are free, but still you are God's servants, and you must not use your freedom as an excuse for doing wrong. Now, that's what Peter wrote, you know, that the Lord wants us to be obedient and that we are free. But I want you to notice there's a reason for both. For example, the Lord wants us to obey all human authorities because God wants us to silence stupid and ignorant people by doing right. You see, there's a greater purpose for the obedience. And you know, I see the same kind of thing happening uh, in, uh, I think the same thing was behind what Peter said to the wives of non-believing husbands. If you are a wife, you must put your husband first. Even if he opposes our message, you will win him over by what you do. No one else will have to say anything to him because he will see how you honor God and live a pure life. You see, whether to a spouse or a king, there there was a purpose behind the obedience. And I'll tell you, I think the same thing applies to how we see our own freedom. You You see, without question, we are free. That's exactly what Peter says. But before we go out and do whatever we want, we need to remember that our mission just might be compromised if we do. Therefore, we must not use our freedom as an excuse for doing wrong. Now, that's what he said. But of course, this is the exact same thing Paul said to the Galatians when he wrote. My friends, you were chosen to be free. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. I'm telling you, God has called us and given us what we have for a reason. Therefore, we must never ignore our purpose. And in in my opinion, to be the church in a challenging world, that's the second temptation we really need to resist. And third, right along with denying its identity, 
and ignoring its purpose. For Peter, the church must also resist the temptation to neglect its responsibility. And I'm talking about its responsibility to everyone. In other words, as strangers with a mission, we have a responsibility to live the kind of life that demonstrates what being a follower of Jesus Christ is all about. And you know, for Peter, it sure seemed to come down to four commands. This is what he wrote. Respect everyone and show special love for God's people. Honor God and respect the emperor. Now, that's what Peter said. And you know, when you get right down to it, it's really not rocket science. We have a responsibility to the people around us to show everyone respect and to be truly loving to one another. I'll tell you, it's like Peter wrote again in the first chapter of his letter. You obeyed the truth and your souls were made pure. Now you sincerely love each other. But you must keep on loving with all your heart. Do this because God has given you new birth by his message that lives on forever. Now, this is how we should treat the men and women we see every day. And as to those who have heavenly power or earthly authority, well, we have a responsibility to show them honor and respect. It's like Paul, it's like what Paul wrote to children in his letter to the Ephesians. Children, you belong to the Lord, and you do right the right thing when you obey your parents. The first commandment with a promise says, obey your father and mother and you'll have a long and happy life. Parents, don't be hard on your children. Raise them properly. Teach them and instruct them about the Lord. Now, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that whether we like it or not, God wants us to treat others in a certain way, to treat them with respect and with love. But it's still up to us to decide whether or not we're actually going to do it. And for that reason, we must never neglect our responsibility. And to be the church in a challenging world, that's the third temptation we really need to resist. Now, if there are thunderstorms later today, Coco will be facing a challenging afternoon and evening. But you know, in a sense, she's actually kind of lucky. Because I'll tell you, I think we face a challenging world 24-7. And even though it may be tempting to make our lives a little easier by trying to sort of blend in, I think Peter challenges us to resist. To resist the temptation to deny our identity, and to resist the temptation to ignore our purpose, and to resist the temptation to neglect our responsibility as the body of Christ. You see, we can resist, and I think that's another way we can be the church in a challenging world. Amen. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you found the sermon meaningful. Of course, if you're ever in the, the neighborhood, I'm talking about Sligo, Pennsylvania, about 10 miles south of Clarion in northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, if you're ever in the neighborhood, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, come on by Sligo Presbyterian Church and worship with us. I think you'll have a good time. Of course, if you're around here on a Wednesday morning at 1030 or a Thursday evening at 630, uh, it, come on by the church and join in in one of two Bible studies. Uh, and one we're right now looking at Genesis and the other we're looking at Luke. Uh, I think you'll, you'll find those meaningful as well. And so until I talk with you again, I want you to remember that you, my friend, you are a child of God. And God loves you very much. Goodbye for now.